Welcome to the show. This is the Magician and the Fool podcast, episode number 56. My name is Dominic. I am one of the hosts of the show. The other host is Janus, and you will hear from him when he jumps on in a little bit. Today, we're really happy to have Mr. Eric Perdue back on the show. He was with us back in episode number 39, I believe, to discuss his new translation of Three Books of Occult Philosophy by Heinrich Cornelius Agrippa. Excellent translation and excellent episode, so if that's something that interests you, I would recommend having a listen. Today, though, we're going to switch gears and talk about something completely different with Eric. He is a longtime practitioner of Uh, Lukumi or Santeria and we have touched on a bunch of the African traditional religions Uh, we had an episode on Espiritismo, on Voodoo, Kimbanda Palo and so now it's it's good that we are touching on Lukumi so this will be a good introduction maybe for people who aren't very familiar and a jumping-off point for further study. Eric has a website. It is ericperdue.com, E-R-I-C-P-U-R-D-U-E.com, and he offers um, traditional astrological services, such as horror readings, uh, full natal readings, electional readings, yearly forecasts, and he does a spiritual reading as well. Before we jump into the episode, as always, I would like to thank all of our Patreon supporters, those who have supported us in the past, those who continue to support us, and anyone who is thinking they may support us in the future. We do appreciate all the help and really do feel like this is a partnership. Thank you again. We dedicate this to Hermes and Asclepius. May any merits that we accumulate doing this work be distributed to all sentient beings so that they, together with us, may equally realize awakening. Welcome to the show. We are here with our returning guest, Eric Perdue. Uh, We had him on a little while back to discuss his translation of Three Books of Occult Philosophy by Agrippa. Um, We did touch on the fact that um, Eric is a practitioner of uh, traditional African uh, system of spirituality, and we are going to focus in on that today. Eric, welcome to the show. Welcome back. Thanks for having me. Thank you. (laughs) Thanks for having hey, me. Eric, great to have you back. Thank you. Nice to be here. Awesome. Yeah, we had a lot of fun last time, so uh, we're really glad you decided to to come back and, and talk with us again. So we are going to talk about Lukumi, which um, is called different things. So our listeners may not be familiar with that term. Can you maybe start us off with uh, maybe a quick rundown on how you got into it and then what it is, and then we'll just roll okay. from there. Yeah, um, I, I I mentioned it a little bit during the interview I did a while back on Agrippa, um, because that's really how I got into magic in general. I, I I had no interest in anything, any kind of African spirituality whatsoever. 
And uh, I, I was looking for, I was, you know, I had some books on the Golden Dawn. I had one of Crowley's books, the Dover edition of Magic and, what was it, Magic and Theory and Practice, I think it was. Um, I read those and I started putting my feelers out and I was, I was looking for a teacher to teach me ceremonial magic. And it seemed like the logical way to go. I was uh, a musician at the time. And this guy I was playing with said, well, hey, I know this mysterious person uh, really knows what he's talking about. And he has a temple and, you know, super powerful. They're very serious. And uh, <laughs> I mentioned this in the last interview because it sounds so so silly. Uh, you know, I, I asked him, I'm like, okay, well, you know, what do I tell him? You know, he gave me this guy's phone number. And he said, you know, he said, well, just tell him you want to make an appointment. And I'm like, well, for what? <laughs> and he said, he said, just, just tell him that he'll know what you mean. And I'm thinking this is a drug deal or something. <laughs> and, you know, I called the number and, you know, he answered and he had this sort of aristocratic, almost English accent, almost like a mid-Atlantic, a Mid-Atlantic accent. Hmm. And he um, sounded very sophisticated. So I said, you know, isn't you know, are you, his, his name is Ordoon, Ordoon, and I'm like, is this Ordoon? And he goes speaking. And I said, I want to make an appointment. And then he said, for what? <laughs> <laughs> I said, look, I have no idea. I want to learn more about all of this. I was giving your number. And he goes, okay, fine. Just come by and we'll, we'll talk. And so I went there and I was immediately stricken. Um, he was an artist. And so he, he, had a, he had a kind of artistic flair about everything. So uh, it, it looked, you know, appropriately mysterious and gothic. Um, you know, I had a 19th century apothecary kind of look about the room. Nice. And he, so we talked for hours. And then he, after a few hours, he he, st- he, he stood up and he said, do you trust me? And I said, I'm, I'm 19 years old. And he's an older guy. And I'm like, I you know, well, you seem nice so far. <laughs> <laughs> and he pushed open, he pushed on the wall and a secret door opened because he likes secret doors. I found out later on. And it really was a Who secret doesn't? door. Yeah. I mean, he, he had the, he had the means to do it. And we went into this other room and it was an Egyptian room with a life-size statue of Isis. He sat me down and he ended up giving me a, uh, you know, African cowrie shell reading, which is called uh, De Lagoon. And he proceeded to pretty much tell me about my life. He told me things I never told anybody. And I was pretty hooked at that point. But he was very uh, measured in what he told me for a long time. So he didn't really tell me this is, you know, Santria, Leukemy. Um, I just figured it was all probably neo-pagan Egyptian stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, but I didn't recognize the language he was speaking. Um, so it could have been ancient Egyptian <laughs> to me. And after about three months, um, he he uh, ambushed me and basically said, hey, do you want to come by for a ceremony? And I said, yeah, great. Yes, I would love to. And I showed up and I was ushered into the back and I was plucking chickens. <laughs> and that was my introduction to ceremony, basically. So, you know, if you don't have anything in the religion, you really can't be in the room where this, where this ceremony is taking place. So I, I was in back learning how to pluck chickens, basically. That was the first time I'd ever done that in my life. So, um, yeah. So, but I was hooked because he, he, he was, you know, a very um, uh, knowledgeable and very charismatic person. So it, it was just kind of easy to get attracted to, you know, what he had. And um, I was with him for 15 years until he died. He initiated me eventually and all that. And, after he died, the 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 house that we were part of uh, pretty much imploded, hmm. and um, I'm only I'm one of only maybe I don't know four people still practicing out of that house. Uh, almost everyone else left the religion, and um, I was kind of disenchanted. And then I eventually started after a few years. I put my feelers out again, and I met uh, my current teacher, and I'm with her now, and here I am. So. Nice. Is she in, in your area? She was. Uh, okay. She's uh, there in Miami now, her and her husband. So they okay. just moved there a few months back. Okay. So a lone in, wolf. Not really. But. So in those instances <laughs> where the house kind of um, falls apart or 
dissipates for whatever reason, then you you, you can join another house then. Yeah, it, there is, you know, there is there is an official protocol that you really should follow. Um, sometimes it's not possible. Sometimes um, people ignore it. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, there, but there is, there isn't, a, you know, traditionally you shouldn't, you know, they, they really didn't look, um, kindly upon people who just jumped, you know, house to house. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, it's very suspicious, I think. Sure. Uh, so a lot of elders would, well, really what should be hit, what, <laughs> what, what used to happen, I, I don't know if it still does. Um, if you leave your, your godparent, um a lot and you, and you approach another godparent a lot of times they'll just call them up and they're like okay hey so and so's here <laughs> and that, i mean that happened to my old godfather actually someone left him and went to someone else and they they called him they said hey just so you know this person here wants to work with me and you know do i have your blessings and you know it was kind of bad blood a little bit at that time so he's like sure but it was very above board um but yeah it's you it, it's it, it's not great but there are there are there are godparents who are who are you know not nice people, mm-hmm. and so sometimes it's not possible. Uh, in my case, you know, really, what happens when the godparent? Because you really, you really should be with that godparent until you, until, until you, they die or one of you dies. And um, you know, there was a you know, there's a little little bit of a pecking order if you you know in your house, like you have a sort of like an assistant godparent that's called an oyubona. You would, you would be passed off to them. You would go to them usually first. Um, my Oyubuna left the religion. <laughs> um, and then a lot of times you would go to the, the elder of the house, or the elder of the house left the religion. Um, and there, there are, there are, there are, I have a few elders left there, but, you know, everything was so dissipated, um, that I ended up, you know, going somewhere else. Mm. And I still, I'm still in communication with them. But yeah, it was, it was, a, you know, it happens. <laughs> yeah. You know, sometimes these things fall apart. So sure, sure. So, um, we mentioned Lukumi and you also mentioned Santeria. Um, so I think that's probably the name most people recognize. Right. Um, what other names is this particular spirituality known for or known yeah, by? So, yeah. So Santeria is by far the most common. Yeah. Uh, Lukumi is, is, um, usually really pre- the, the people in the religion often will call it that. Mm-hmm. Um, the less common, but also correct term is uh, Rela de Ocha, which is like, you know, the rule of Ocha in Spanish. My Spanish isn't amazing, believe it or not. <laughs> <laughs> but um, almost no one calls it that. That in my experience, I've never heard anybody just actually say that. Okay. Okay. Um, and so we, we've talked to um, practitioners of, of Palo, of Voodoo, um, Espiritismo, what what uh, makes Santeria or Lukumi stand out from those different traditions? Similarities, differences. Well, so Lukumi is, and I'm just going to call it that. Okay, <laughs> um, is just like Paulo is a result of the slave trade in Cuba, and Paulo is predominantly uh, Congo origin. And they were, they were the first ones in Cuba. So they, they predate Lukumi by, I don't know, maybe a hundred years or so. So by the time, uh, the Lukumi people came to Cuba, uh, Palo or the Congo were, were firmly established. The, so Santeria is, or Lukumi is predominantly of the Yoruban people in West Africa. It's very, very close to the Congo too. So th- this is all uh, very, j- very broadly speaking, uh, a pretty close area. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's also some uh, people from um, who are Dahomean, uh, also called the Adada. And the initially the the Palo and the the Lukumi didn't really mix very much. Um, today there isn't quite so much animosity <laughs> uh in the old days there was but um so what makes us stand out so um my knowledge of paulo is a bit um spotty to be honest okay. with you because i'm not uh really too deep into it um but lukami deals with um orishas which are pretty much uh we can almost think of them as deities mm-hmm. 
you know, they, most people will say they're angels, but um, but they're they're basically deities. So you have um, you know, Shango, the Orisha of Thunder, Oshun, the Orisha of the River, Yamaya, the ocean, you know, so on and so forth. And so that, that's that's the that's the, the biggest characteristic. Mm-hmm. Um, so you know, you, the, when you're initiated as a priest, you receive a minimum of five Orishas, and they're all the same ones. And then depending who you get initiated to, you may get an extra one, and that can change a little bit. But everybody has the same five. Um, Paulo is a little bit more um, ancestral. Well, they're both ancestral. Lukumi, Lukumi believes that the ancestors come first, and everything comes from the ancestors. Okay. Um, and the Orisha work through the ancestors. So everything is very lineage-based. So everything works through lineage. Are the Orishas ever seen as as being ancestors or as being the dead um, originally? It's complicated. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> it they, is complicated. They work, don't they? Don't they sort of? Aren't the Orishas more akin to um, transpersonal forces, and then they animate Igun or ancestors? Um, uh, and the ancestors embody those energies th- through their personalities. Some people say that. Um, okay. There isn't really official do- doctrine that I can that I've seen because uh, you get a lot of different opinions. But in my opinion, there is some sort of ancestral component to it. So, for instance, you know, every initiate has Shango. I'm biased, <laughs> and you know, there's only one Shango. Like, you know, there's, there, there, you know, some Orishas have all these different, you know, kinds of aspects and that kind of thing, but there's only one Shango. But, but when you're, when you're dealing with people, different people who have Shango, you will notice that there's, there's kind of differences. And I think that difference is ancestral. Um, I've heard, I've been told that when they come under possession, um, when they possess people, it's, it is like an old Orisha or some, you know, past, person who is sort of you know um i guess kind of uh how do i say it is passing shango through them so the, they're actually they're almost like it's like an intermediary in some ways um so the dead is the the the, the spirit of the dead is a medial principle that allows the transduction of an impersonal uh more transcendent force to enter the microcosmic yeah. realm of the human interaction. That's, that's one way to look at it. Yeah. I, I, I've been told in the past that, you know, no one really gets possessed directly by the full Arisha. Mm. Uh, it's almost like, a I don't know. I, in, in the way my brain works, I almost think of it as, as acting as a, the, the, the ancestor acting as a, like a, 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 a tempering influence. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know, but you know, it's, it's, it's spooky because I, I have had the experience of, um, you know, there's a, a lot of different Abatalas, for instance, there's about, you know, I don't know, a dozen or so, 15 different types of Abatala. And there's a particular Obatala I've seen come down a lot. And I, I have had the experience, experience where they have possessed different people, but there's a recognition to me. <laughs> So it's, all, mm-hmm. it's like they, it's like they know who you are, hmm. uh, even though the person may not know who you are. It's a, it's a very spooky experience, huh? Okay, yeah, there's a familiarity there. Okay, and maybe can you maybe go into the Orisha a little bit more? Um, I like mean, who they are? Yeah, who they are, um, what they are a little bit more. I mean, it sounds like they are more, I don't know, forces of nature in in some respects. Yes, at, at the most basic. Yeah, uh, they're forces of nature. So in the cosmology, there's, uh, there's, there's a sort of a trinity, uh, Oludumari, uh, Olofi and, um, Olodun. And they, <clears throat> they're sort of like the, the prime, like, it's almost, that's almost God, basically. Mm-hmm. Um, we don't really interact with them. Uh, there are a couple of minor exceptions to that, but generally speaking, we don't really have, um, there's no initiations to them. You don't receive them. They don't possess nothing like that. Um, there are a couple of little ceremonies here and there, but, uh, for the most part, you're dealing with 
Eurisha, which is sort of you know, like lower in order to them. Mm-hmm. Uh, so the top would be Obatala, who is usually symbolized as being like an old man. Um, he is, um, you know, he deals with, you know, purity, uh, wisdom. He's, you know, up in the clouds. Uh, he is the mountains, uh, that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm speaking very generally because, like I said, there's about, you know, 12, 15 or so different types of bat- batalas, and some of them are young. There are a couple of female ones. Um, but generally that's, that, that's what people say. My batala happens to be a young one too. You have Yamaya, who is the ocean. And she's, uh, you know, sort of like a mother goddess type of, you know, Arisha. Um, very popular also. Uh, Oshun, who's the river. And she's, she symbolizes, you know, female sensuality in a lot of ways too. Uh, she's also one of the most complex Arishas to understand. Uh, there's, she, she has her hands on a lot of, <laughs> in a lot, a, a lot of pies because uh, she, she deals with, uh, the Babalaos. There's a connection there. She deals with the, uh, the drums. There's a connection there as well. Uh, so she's kind of, you know, all over the place. Um, Shango, who I'm initiated to is the Arisha of Thunder. And he also represents kings in general and, um, masculine virility, you know, like, um, Masculine sensuality. Um, Eligua is a trickster, often symbolized as a child. That's not really, I don't think it's really him, but <laughs> he's usually symbolized as a child. Um, Arisha, the crossroads, trickster, uh, beginnings and endings. Um, so those are the most popular ones. Those are the ones that everyone has when they're initiated. Uh, there's a hundred more. Uh, <laughs> you have Ogun, who's a blacksmith. Um, uh, iron. Um, there's Ochosi, who's a hunter. I could go on and on. There's probably a good hundred, but the most popular of those are those five. Uh, those are the ones that most people know about. Um, you know, <laughs> online people always want to, you know, show off their Oshun altars, which really don't have Oshun on them, but, um, but yeah, Oshun is extremely popular in the, in the popular, you know, sort of web space. Why do you think that she, is? Why? Yeah. Because she is um, female sensuality and she is, you know, kind of like that feminine beauty. And she also, I, I, I think it's just a very attractive, seductive kind of draw for people. I mean, Obatala, I mean, most people don't talk about Obatala, you know, even though he's probably the most, one of the most important, well, like, arguably the most important Arisha because they all sort of come from him. But he doesn't have that sort of, you know, popular, you know, sexy draw that Oshun does, I guess. But um, also, you know, Oshun deals with a lot of magic of, you know, like where you have problems with someone, you can work with Oshun to sweeten that relationship. And people need that a lot. Um, so I, I think people might have these altars to sort of, you know, capture some of that, that power. Yeah, I, I, I don't entirely know why she's the most popular, but I think that she, I think it's that sort of, you know, that, that's, that seductive quality that she has is, has a lot to do with it. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. And you met, you mentioned a little bit earlier that the triad or the Trinity of kind of impersonal transcendent, um, it's basically God and deity is kind of like a, a yeah. there's kind of like a monotheistic feel to with the, with the Trinity as well. Um, mm-hmm. What was I going to ask you about that? I don't even know what <laughs> where I was going with that. Uh, so, okay, w- what's is there like a cosmology as far as like the creation and and how the Orishas are connected to to this god? Yeah, there, there's a lot of different myths, and there's and it gets kind of complicated because you have there there's some influence also with the Dahomian um, mm. religions too, and some of the Orishas that we have that are Dahomian have this kind of primal, how do I say it? I wouldn't say they're above the other Orishas, but they're, it's kind of beyond them. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, Babalu Aye is probably the most common, most well-known one. He deals with illness, that kind of a thing. But there's some, there's some female uh, Orishas from that pantheon that are, are just kind of beyond, kind of beyond like the normal uh, Orisha sphere, but uh, like Nana Buruku and Nanu or uh, Nana, and um even a locun in some ways 
who's not sort of Dahomey and sort of not. But yeah, so it's cosmology. The, the basic idea is that that Trinity created the universe and that Obatala came from Ola Dumari. Mm-hmm. And the other, and basically, the other reaches came from Obatala, and Obatala created humans. There's a myth where, or a story where, um, you know, Obatala was fashioning humans and he liked his palm wine a little bit too much. And so some of the humans, you know, came out sort of flawed. And, you know, here we are. <laughs> um, but also people who are disabled, um, have, mm-hmm. are, are, are especially important, you know, sacred to Obatala. Um, for that reason, Mm -hmm. but, uh, Obatala is, is, you know, really owns all of us, owns all of our heads. You know, we were all born from Obatala and then we die. We're, we're Obatala again, sort of, uh, if we happen to, um, be initiated to another Risha, there, it's almost like they're borrowing us Mm. in a way. Um, so Obatala always gets the top, you know, top billing. And, you know, most of the time, you know, when you have your Orishas, they usually tell you to put your Obatala at, at the highest level, no matter who you are. Uh, Obatala always takes that sort of, you know, most important, you know, place. Okay. And as as you're well aware, in the Western tradition, I guess, there are some schools of thought that say that we are born associated with a certain planet or a certain daimon associated with a certain planet or a sphere. Mm-hmm. Um, is there is there a similar thing uh, with the Orisha? Sort of, but it can change. Okay. So, you know, according to some of the stories, so according to, according to some of the stories, there is an issue that is sort of appointed to us before we're born, and I'm I'm paraphrasing this a lot, <laughs> sure. paraphrasing this a lot, but um, and he helps us. And so when you're born, you basically have that destiny. Yeah. And that and, and and that's what you carry with you. When you get initiated, things change a little bit. Okay. Um, but also even that Arisha that accompanies you that you're that you may be initiated to at some point, that Arisha can change up to that point. So a lot of times when you're when you go through the whole ceremony to find out who your Arisha is, a lot of people will tell you to do it pretty pretty quickly before you're going to get initiated because there, and there've been a lot of stories where you find out who your Risha is and then, you know, 10 years passes or more. And, um, and then you find out 10 years down the line that some other Risha took over <laughs> and that, that, that has happened a few times. And, and usually people will have you just not do it too far in advance to make things simpler on you. Interesting. Um, but, and really, the reason why you get an Arisha at all is is to help you. So it, it, it's it's not it's not like a sun sign where you know I'm a Sean Go, so I'm going to be a womanizer and drink all the time and whatever. And I'm an Olegua, and I'm going to play tricks on everybody. It, it really, I, in my mind, the point should be that you're assigned an Arisha works is works with you to help you. Sometimes it's not that you have the nature of that Arisha. It's, it's, it's that Arisha is there to give you something that you didn't have. There's mm-hmm. a, there's a, multi, there's a multi dimensional thing to this because sometimes, yeah, you could be dripping in, you know, Shango energy, but, or maybe that's what you need. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, okay. And so that, that issue that you had mentioned that was assigned to you as kind of a guardian angel type. In a way, thing. I guess. Um, does that Eshu continue to interact? Do you interact with them once you are initiated uh, with an Orisha? Well, everybody receives an Eshu, usually, uh, even if you're not initiated. It's very common to receive one. And most how there are, there are li- different lineages do this differently, but there are, um, what is it, 121 or so different uh, Eleguas out there, Eshus, mm-hmm. Eleguas. And ideally, you should be finding out which one you're supposed to have, because uh, you because you, each elegua should be different and should be handmade and made made for you. And um, yeah, so there there's a divination that when you receive elegua that you that you don't sit in yourself necessarily, but the person giving it to you should do a divination of some kind to find out what it is that you're getting. Mm-hmm. And um, 
yeah, so that's that's usually what you're initiated with as well. Cool. <clears throat> Janice, I don't want to hog the mic. Do you have any anything <laughs> you want to? Because I, I can keep going, but what do you got? And by, the way, to... and, and by the way, this is the first time you've spoken publicly about all this, so it's a little, uh, little strange. Yeah, thanks for doing it, yeah. for sure. <laughs> oh, yeah, no problem. Um, I think it would benefit our listeners for you to just maybe elucidate a sort of this sort of talos of lukumi um you know why the why and the how uh because you know we've talked a little bit about initiation and your backstory and some of the orisha but for somebody green um it's still going to seem like french to them you know so uh, if you could maybe give a broad outline of the of the sort of raison d'etre the experience the, yeah yeah and you know and the means by which the goal is achieved and the reason people engage in this religion and the um you know the mechanism by which it confers blessings upon its initiates i think that might be a helpful way to give people a clearer picture well most of the time people are come into this either because they're born into it or because they need something and that's increasingly becoming the case now because in the old days, um, especially in Cuba, people you know lived in their neighborhoods and that's kind of where you were. And so it was more likely you're going to know someone <laughs> um, very intimately because they're were, they were from your neighborhood or whatever, or part of your family or, or whatever. But today uh, we're, we, we, we're down in a situation where everybody's spread out and this religion is bigger than it ever has been. Uh, but what I see usually is people are looking for something, uh, whether it's because they have a spiritual problem or it's a real world problem of some kind, um, or there's this burning need to experience, uh, something spiritual. That's kind of why I got into it. I, I wanted to have something real happen and I wanted knowledge. And that's another reason too. Uh, but you know, it, what most people should be starting out with is some sort of divination by a qualified priest or priestess. Uh, we call them older rishas and they should have a reading to sort of see where things are and kind of go from there. Because really once, once you get started, everything is individual. People's paths, there's a path for every single person, basically, uh, which is one of the things I like about it because it's not really cookie cutter. Uh, but what most people start with is they find a godparent that they like. And in my, and I believe that they should take that slowly. Uh, because in a perfect world, you're with that godparent for the rest of your life. And it's not like a marriage. Um, it's, it's, it's a, a very unique relationship. Um, that you should take seriously and the godparent should take it seriously too. Um, there are a lot of predators out there, <laughs> a lot of people who aren't honest, but there's a lot of amazing people as well. So it's like when you, you know, go on a date with someone, if something, if you get red flags and you run away, uh, but if you hit it off with someone, get a reading and usually people start with getting a set of necklaces that are called alekes. And that kind of marks you as being part of, um, that house. It's called an ile. And most houses give you five necklaces. Pretty much the same everywhere. Uh, some houses give you four, some give you five, or most give you five. Uh, so you get a necklace for Obatala, Yamaya, Shango, Oshun, and Eligua. So it's pretty much the same everywhere. The patterns could be a little different uh, due to the house, um, but they should all be you know, consecrated. There's a ceremony to that. Not a very complicated ceremony. Um, takes about a day or so, maybe half a little bit less than a day. And from that point on, you're part of the house. And you're not going to know anything. <laughs> you have to kind of show up. <laughs> and um, that doesn't really allow you to um, do ceremonies for other people. Um, it doesn't really, you're not allowed to be part of a lot of ceremonies because they're, you're not a priest yet. You're not initiated. Um, but you can learn. Um, a lot of godparents will have them learn 
the songs. Um, you can go to Mises, you know, as part of his Spiritismo. Um, you can go to those. In fact, both houses I've been part of uh, make the Mises, which or seances in English, I guess you could call it that. Um, that's a very important part of this. Is even though it's not really part of Lukumi, it's you know to- uh, technically a separate system, uh, but almost everyone does it. Cool. Um, that's open. I mean, everybody, everyone has ancestors, so mm-hmm. um, most people will receive the warriors pretty early on. Uh, that's um, Elegua, Ogun, and Ochosi, and Osun, not Oshun, but Osun. <laughs> Little rooster on a on a cup, and. Um, and that's that's yours. I mean, that's that's you keep that for the rest of your life. You can do a lot of you can do a lot of work with that with that set of orishas. Um, that that can carry you through the rest of your life. Actually, if you ever get initiated, that's that you get initiated with those as well. And yeah, pretty much after that, it's it's whatever happens. Uh, there's a few orishas that are pretty common that people can receive, uh, and not be in, actually you can receive any orisha and not be initiated. It just gets a little bit more unusual, <laughs> but it is possible. I've I've seen it before. Eventually, yeah, I mean, you, you can, you know, during this time, you know, you can, you basically can show up and help. Like I did plucking chickens. That's pretty common. You show up to pluck chickens. You can learn how to cook. Uh, you can learn the songs. If there are drummings, you can, you can come to the drummings. There's a lot you can actually do. And a lot of godparents will give you homework and, you know, things that you can learn. And then eventually, if, if you get called to it or if something comes up in some divination, uh, you can be initiated. Uh, that's a very complicated procedure. Um, that's where you, you become a priest. And uh, that ceremony takes about a year, or sorry, a year. It takes a, a week and then a year of very restricted living. <laughs> um, you have to, you have to wear white for a year. You're not supposed to be out after dark, you know, things like that. Uh, you have to be very careful about it for about a year. Once that year is up, you can pretty much, you know, do what you want. Within reason, um, but for most people, they start out zelekes, maybe warriors, and frankly, in my opinion, that's enough for most people. Mm-hmm. Um, people kind of romanticize getting initiated, or everyone thinks they have to get initiated. And you know, in the old days, it wasn't like that. You know, you had a fairly small number of initiates, a smaller number of babalaos, and they serviced an entire community. You know, so there's a lot you can do with those warriors. Well, that doesn't get you much clout on Facebook. It doesn't. It doesn't. <laughs> it's kind of funny. I, there was, I can't remember who it was. And, I, and if I did, I wouldn't say it here. Uh, but there was some occultist who was, you know, one of those like title droppers. Mm-hmm. And he was listing all these titles that he, that he has amassed in his, in his travels. And one of those was Abarisha, which basically means he just has his necklaces. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, oh, good job there. <laughs> Paid a couple hundred bucks there and you got that set of necklaces. Great. <laughs> right. Right. So you said, um, you said like people can do a lot of work with even the basics that they receive. And like, your ancestors. What do you mean? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What do you, what do you mean by that though? Like, say you receive those, you know, the, the basic initiation, the collars and like, what kind of work is a person able to do when they receive their Orisha? Do you mean like, um, just like heavy warriors, you mean, or? Yeah, like well, because you said you said you know I don't you your your point was that you don't think that people need to be initiated necessarily because, I mean initiated as right. priests excuse, necessarily because they can do a lot with just you know with just receiving, mm-hmm. you know. So I'm just wondering, like for example, like what can they do? Like what what is what is the benefit of even receiving? Well, that? it's easier to say what they can do. Um, what they can't do. If you're not a priest, that you can't do work for other people. Um, that's kind of that's that's the 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 hard rule right there. But otherwise, if you working for yourself, uh, I mean, the warriors will cover almost everything. And El El Agua is kind of the world in a in a lot of ways to me. That's how I, I see him. And even today, I have you know twenty something Orishas, and El Agua is my first one I go to most of the time, and. Yeah, so you can do, like, if you're having difficulties at work, hopefully under the guidance of your godparent, <laughs> um, there are workings you can do to help you out at work, you know, or if, um, 
you have any troubles with someone, there's things you can do about that, you know, with, with, with your warriors. So maybe not just Aligua, maybe it's Ogun, maybe it's Ochosi, you know. Uh, Osun, who's not as popular, not as well known, um, is, has a lot to do with your stability. And some people who have issues with, you know, keeping your feet on the ground, so to speak, and their head, you know, their head's always in the clouds. Sometimes Osun, Osun can help with that as well. Um, but yeah, Eligua, that, that's like, if you need something or not, not just Eligua, Eligua and the, and the rest of the warriors, if you need something, you go to them. And, um, yeah, usually like the guide parent will give you some sort of, can give you instructions on something you can do, like some sort of a working. When you say Eligua is the world, what do you mean by it's, that? That's me talking. That That's kind of, that's my brain. Uh, you're not going to find that in the book, but Eligua is, um, Kind of in a world on a, on a class of his own, and he's seen as a trickster, but he's not a random tr- trickster. He basically keeps the world, I think, kind of keeps things in order in a lot of ways. He he can basically do he can basically do anything, really. You know, like for instance, like you think of I don't know, I'm trying to think of an example. Like we've been talking about Oshun. So Oshun, you know, is rivers, and she's like you know, you know, uh, sensuality and that kind of a thing, and she can help sweeten your relationship between you know between someone that you're having trouble with that sort of a thing um and, and that's kind of her specialty and she could do more than that or you know of course but elegua you can just kind of like you just go to him first and if you know how to do divination you can even ask elegua it's like do i work with you or do i work with some other orisha and a lot of times i'll start with him because that way i know that i'll get the right direction but when i say the world he can he can basically cover any ground <laughs> um what would you what would you say is would be the closest kind of western equivalent to elegua a lot of people a lot of people compare him to mercury or hermes i don't think that's really very complete because he's also deals with the beginnings and endings of things so if we're doing a lot of work with a lot of reaches you work with elegua first uh because you know he opens the door so to speak, um, astrologically, that's that would be the, the that would be the moon. Mm-hmm. Um, well, but when we're going deep here, I mean, Mercury is also a god of beginnings yeah. and endings. He's a terminal god who exists at the crossroads. Who's at the who you know who's Herm Hermai were at the outside of towns, just like the just like the sort of um, uh, if you go to Africa and you you know Eshu is always right outside the town or you know right near the gate, just like that's exactly where the Hermai were for Hermes. Right. And then there's a historical relationship between the Moon and Mercury, and like you know, uh, whereas you know if you look at Thoth, he's he's a Moon mm-hmm. god, but Hermes yeah. is a Mercurial god. But it, so I mean, it, it's really interesting when you start going deeper because the parallels start to line up if you have a broader idea of who Hermes is. And also, if you just get a cat, like a, just a non-specific uh, shell reading from a priest, the shells that they're using are the ones that that, that are associated with Eligua. It's it's almost always going to be Eligua. Interesting. There are exceptions, but that's a very complicated divination. Uh, it's uh, 256 signs. Mm. Uh, and each one of those signs can come in many orientations. So it's a very difficult system to learn. I'm sort of slowly learning it myself, but, um, you know, there are some amazing diviners out there. That's cool. And so I would assume you'd have to be initiated as a priest to do. You have to. Yeah. 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 You have to. Um, there, there are several reasons because the shells, the shells are consecrated. Um, but you also have to have that Arisha and not to mention just all the training and you have to know what to do. And, um, and, you know, there are, there are some signs that are complicated that, you know, I mean, they, they, you know, that you may have to tell the person you're giving a reading to do some sort of an offering to one of your Arishas. So if you're not initiated, what are you going to do? Um, it's, it's a mess. I, people, there are people out there who try to do it. I don't know how they're, how they think they're, they're working it, but. And that, and that's specifically an Olorisha thing because, uh, uh, Baba Laos do not work with shells. Uh, they work with, um, palm nuts. Um, still, still roughly the same system. It's, you know, 256 signs and all that. Um, but they have a different medium, sort of a different focus. 
All right. I'm not sure if you covered everything you were planning on covering. We kind of I had no plan. There. I'm just I feel like I'm dabbling <laughs> and I'm and, and not making any sense whatsoever. No, no, no. It's great. It's been great so far. <laughs> if you're good, um, I was curious about a term, and I'm not sure how to pronounce it. If it's uh, ache or ache, ache, uh, ache, or ache, okay. actually. Can you maybe talk about that a little bit? Yeah, ache is. Um, <laughs> there are a couple of, of your Ruben, your Ruben words like this. I sort of have a bunch of meetings. Um, I, I sort of define it as like divine power in a way. That's, that, that's the easiest way to describe it. And everybody has a shay. And when you are initiated, you're instructed in how to maintain that and to keep it, keep you healthy there. Uh, because you can sort of squander it too. But yeah, it's, 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 uh, it's, it's, a, it's a sort of like a divine power. So like, you know, that's, that's what, allows an Olorisha or a priest to be able to make an Orisha is Ashe. Um, that's what allows them to be able to speak and have that actually mean something special as opposed to just random words. Um, you know, there's a, you know, there's a, an importance to the tongue and what you say and the words that you use can create and destroy and that's that's an ashe. <laughs> and there are some people that, you know, when they speak something, um, they can manifest things, good or ill. And um but yeah, like you know, cause because the, the 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 I mentioned before that the sort of like the link with all this is an, is ancestral. Mm-hmm. Um and when you receive an Arisha, you have to receive it from someone who has that Arisha. But that transference is ashe. And you're sort of in a way, you know, sort of like a a mother giving birth to a baby, um, there is a transfer of, of energy that that mother gives to the baby, and it kind of depletes the mother for a little while. Um, so it's a, a little, little, you know, little, little taxing. So there's, you know, ways that we have to not hurt ourselves in doing that. Uh, I won't go, won't go into details about that, but basically, it's it's just that it's just that power, that that divine power. And how is that power built through devotional practice and interaction? It's practice your your day to day actions. Yeah, um, the food you eat. Um, a lot of times, you know, when you're initiated, you get um, guidelines on you know foods you sh- should stay away from or foods that you should eat more of. Um, sometimes it sounds random, um, but sometimes it's not even that esoteric. I mean, sometimes it's things that that you shouldn't eat them because it's going to make you sick. And sometimes it's really obvious. Yeah, you know, there are people who can't use narcotics. That's pretty obvious. So it's a prescribed. The, the food thing is is more prescribed on a, it's uh, always yeah, it's prescribed. case it by case, be. case by case. Okay, there should be nothing universal. People act like there is sometimes because people will say things like, "Oh, you're initiated, yeah, yeah, you can't have shellfish." That's not true. That that shouldn't be true. So yeah, it, it's it's always case by case, and um. The only thing that's kind of universal is when you're initiated, most houses say you should not eat pumpkin. <laughs> huh. I know it sounds funny to people. Um, that has a lot to do with, you know, your prosper- prosperity. It's okay. a kind of an Oshun thing. Um, I haven't had pumpkin in over you know, 25 years. I don't know. <laughs> Luckily, there aren't that many <laughs> pumpkin dishes out there. I don't know. <laughs> I've got I've gotten used to sweet potato pie. <laughs> There, there's some some people argue about that too, but most people say it's pumpkin. Uh, but pretty much everything else is individual. So you know, you have people who say like, "Oh, I can't, I can eat shellfish." Well, you know, I can. <laughs> yeah, you know, um, I have no problem with it. Okay, so. and I assume that can change over time. Well, you don't usually get it back. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, there there are so when you receive certain orishas, there's a a major reading that you get. That's called the anita, uh-huh. and that anita is a reading that sticks for the rest of your life, and um, and, and often that's when that that will come up. Okay, foods. Okay, so if they tell you no shellfish at that anita, then that's it that's for it. life. <laughs> that's okay. it. Okay. <laughs> wow. Wow. Yeah. It isn't just food. There's, there's other little things. You know, a com- another common one. Some people are told they can't um, get their head wet from rainwater. That's, wow. that's a popular one. Um, yeah, there's, there's all sorts of little things. 
So what like kind that. of restrictions do you have? <laughs> I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna go through all of them. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's not it actually they were they were pretty easy on me. Um, okay. Like well, one that uh, I I will talk about is I was told that I can't have leftovers. Huh. And that's become a little bit difficult sometimes, but I'm also bad at leftovers anyway, though. But that one's practical because um, that's you know that's part of a a series of things that talk about getting poisoned by bad food or something. So that you know something like that is really you know I look at that and that's that sounds pretty practical to me. Yeah. Um, so it isn't all just, you know, hocus pocus. Um, you know, you, you get struck by lightning if you, if you, <laughs> if you eat this. Uh, but some of it, you know, some of it can be things like, you know, don't eat this. And that can be the one thing I'll save your life eventually. Mm. Um, that comes up sometimes. Uh, but sometimes it's, you know, there could be other reasons. And, you know, and, 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 you know, people spend a lot of time like going back and forth about that. And it's, it's almost like, um, People like gossiping about that. Oh, really? A lot, yeah. And it really shouldn't be that type of thing. It's really there to help you. And um, but yeah, some people people will talk endlessly about the restrictions they have, and it's like, what's the big deal? I mean, don't eat liver; it's okay. Yeah, I mean, something like that would be easy. But geez, if you get initiated or, or you get that reading at nineteen, and they say don't get your head wet from rainwater, that'd be, <laughs> that'd be get rough. used to it. I was actually told that pretty recently, though. Oh, really? But, yeah. But like, um, I mean, there, I mean, there are people who get initiated with their babies and, um, that, you know, that does happen as well. And you just, you just deal with it, you know, and, you, and really the reach don't give you things that you can't handle anyway. It's not like, they're not going to tell you, they're, they're not going to take water away from you <laughs> anything like that. It's just, yeah, it's not that big of a deal. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, that's very interesting. <laughs> Something I wanted to touch on before um, we wrap up, and I don't think we're quite ready to wrap up, but um, I don't know how long this particular topic will go, but I'm here all night, folks. <laughs> but you like we had you on for a, our Agrippa episode. Um, mm-hmm. You spent a lot of time with Agrippa, put a lot of energy into that. You are uh, an accomplished astrologer practitioner in Western spirituality. Um, and obviously, as we could we could tell just by talking this past, you know, 45 minutes or so, you are v- deeply involved in this, this African uh, mm-hmm. sp- spirituality. How do you, because c- I assume not everything is compatible between the two systems. I mean, I, right. I think if you do a, a lot of gymnastics, you could make it so that it's, it is, but so, so how do you kind of, walk that line between these two systems, which may not have compatible elements. Cause I would assume as a serious astrologer and practitioner in the Western um, traditions, you believe in those systems, yeah. you know, and you know, you live your life based on kind of that, that worldview, but also the same, the same on the, the African side. So how does that work for you? Uh, I don't, well, first of all, Lukumi doesn't really, restrict doing other spiritual practices Mm -hmm. uh, within reason. I want to say it that way, because really, I think in a nutshell, the Risha tend to restrict things that that will hurt you. And without getting into specifics or have been, I have seen a few things come up with specific spiritual practices, but I don't think it's universal. Like in other words, I, this is this is not a real example. I'm just going to make this one up. Okay. Um, but let's just say you're 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 in the golden dawn. Okay. And let's just say something comes up, or they'll say, "Hey, you really should not." You know, that there's going to be some danger associated with that. Mm-hmm. It'd be kind of weird if they said that to, to begin with. I'm just making up this example. Sure. But um, it's not that's not a universal thing. They're not saying that it's bad. It's really more of an issue with you and that. Rather than like there being some like, you know, thou shalt not have other gods before us. I don't mix anything with leukemia. I keep things very separate. I was suggested to study astrology through leukemia, through a reading. Um, I've known people who um, have been told that it would help their spirituality if they maybe spent time going to a Buddhist temple. 
or a synagogue or 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 a Catholic church or something like that. Um, so nothing is really barred uh, universally. It, it, to me, to me, it's like anything. Really, I, I, it it's it's what is right for you. Like what what practices are going to help you become the best you? And maybe you resonate with Asian spirituality, for instance. And here you are initiated in African religion. And maybe the Orisha know that that's where you find your peace. It's fine. It doesn't hurt anybody. Uh, they're okay with that. But I never, ever, ever mix things. I don't, I don't try to find, um, I'm not really into syncretizing the Orisha with the, with the planets, for instance. Um, I think, I think it's kind of dumb. So when I do an astrology reading, it's just astrology. When I do, uh, when I'm in a, when I get divination for leukemy, it's that's that's its own thing. I, I never I never mix things. Uh, translating Agrippa did sort of make me envision the universe as a whole a little bit differently, uh, which is not incompatible with leukemy. Just not from an official doctrinal way, <laughs> but uh, but I, I I was able to make some comparisons there. But as a whole, I don't mix them at all. And, and there's really no, there's no confusion with that. But, you know, that happens too. There are people, even in, in you know, even if you're in Olorisha and you, and you practice Palo, you, you shouldn't be mixing that as well either, even though they're both African and they're both in Cuba. Uh, mm-hmm. you should not be mixing those. And most people don't. There are a few who do, but most don't. So it's, it's kind of ingrained in the system to be able to have that, that kind of compartmentalized thinking. Uh huh. And, and one of the things I, I, I did want to mention, and this made me think of it, is that I've seen a lot of things online over the years where, you know, kind of, you know, people tend to look at, at, you know, Apollo is like the sort of like the dark cousin of leukemy. And, and then they look at, at, at voodoo as like another kind of like kind of dark version of, of you know, whatever, but it's, they're really all, they're, they're just all religions, basically. They're not, they, Leukemia has this kind of reputation of Santria, as most people don't know, it has a reputation for being very Catholic, for instance. And I will tell you, and people don't believe me, there is not as much there as you would think. And if people look at Paulo or Voodoo as being kind of the more goth, you know, versions of this, um, they're wrong. Because they're all, they're all like, and they're not the same, but they're, they're all light and dark. There's all light, you know, there's all spectrums in all of these religions. Yeah. Um, it isn't all like peace and light in, in, in Santeria either. I, I, I do think that, that, you know, Apollo has certain, um, things that it does really, really well. And Leukemia has things that it does really, really well. And I'm not at all versed in voodoo, but I'm going to assume it does as well. <laughs> Um, yeah. but it, it's, but they're not like, it's not like a competitive light, dark sort of a thing. Like people say, yeah. um, but as far as the Catholic element, it, it gets very complicated because, you know, culturally Cubans are, are Catholic. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know if that's changing now, um, more recently, but, uh, but generally they're, they're pretty Catholic, but when you're doing leukemia, it is not Catholic. Uh, there are no saint statues in that, in that ritual room. We don't generally call them by the saint names there's a couple of exceptions uh we don't do christian prayers in the ocho room <laughs> um it's 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 all african and um and i actually got kicked out of a group one time because this person had read a few books and said well yeah well that's what they do it's you have saint statues in the room i'm like uh dude i've initiated people <laughs> <laughs> we have no saint statues um, but it, it gets, it gets confusing because in Cuba, especially, you, you don't really have this here in the States, but in Cuba, you would have, you know, like, Saint, uh, the, you know, like St. Processions. And, and, you know, and sometimes that would kind of like meld into like, maybe the, uh, they would have a, do a St. Procession on the Saint's day. And then they would take an Orisha that's secretized with that Saint and maybe have a drumming for that Orisha that day as well, like a private one. Um, so things kind of look like on the surface, they appear to be kind of blurry. Um, but it's, it's, it, it really is, it's, it's pretty compartmentalized more than you would think. And, uh, and honestly, the syncretism 
is not, I think, what Americans really think of. Americans really make that kind of blurry and complicated. Um, I mean, the reality is when the Yoru- the Yoruban slaves were taken from Africa and sent to Cuba, they already knew what Christianity was. It wasn't like they were ignorant of Christianity. Yeah. The secretism had already, had already happened because that, that's kind of what people do in general. In Cuba, of course, they had no choice but to be Catholic. Um, but it wasn't like they were, they weren't really hiding so much, uh, in that sense. I mean, it gets complicated because, you know, the, the Cuban slavery looked very different than American slavery. And in Cuba, you could buy your freedom. Um, there was a difference between what people in the city experience versus in the country. So there are all these little, there's, there's some, there are some differences. And, and the, and the Cuban slavery went a little bit longer than the American slavery, too. I think it was the 1880s when it was abolished. And leukemia de- developed as as a kind of an indoor religion. You know, in Africa, it's outdoors. Um, but it, it, it developed as an indoor religion out of, out of necessity because you had to. I mean, um, and a lot of the practices developed in, you know, the city. Again, that, even that's complicated because complicated there are versions of leukemia that are in the country that are a little different. But... <laughs> But that, but what we practice here in the states is, is very citified. Mm-hmm. So we do it in our house, and you know. But to say that they're hiding the reaches and saint statues and the slave owners or the authorities were ignorant of that, I, th- I think is not accurate. Everybody knew what was going on. Yeah, thanks for emphasizing that. We've we've heard that a few times from guests as well, and it's good to to kind of keep that drumbeat going because. That is one of the major kind of misconceptions out there for sure, I think. Yeah. And uh, yeah, we, we, um, and it's, it just comes up a lot. I, I, I've, I've heard a lot of people say, you know, of course, these are people who've never met a practitioner, but they'll say things that it's this corrupted, uh, you know, Catholic version of, you know, African spirituality. And it's, it's not, and it's, you know, it, it's not, it, it isn't that cut and dry because we, we preserve things that aren't in Africa today. Africa preserved things that we don't have. Brazil preserved things that we don't have, and we preserve things that Brazil doesn't have. So it's it's all over the map. We're also talking about cultural drifts and cultural osmosis. Right. I mean, and a lot of these concepts are beyond the pale of your average um, internet physicist, <laughs> <laughs> armchair physicist. <laughs> Uh, it, yeah, it, it's actually a subject. I'm starting to get to, uh, more into the history, so I'm a you know, I spent many years trying to figure out how this stuff works, uh, and lately I've been trying to get more into the history, and um, it's fascinating because, I mean, really the, the leukemia history isn't that old, really. I mean, leukemia as we know it is probably late 1800s. Um, I have, I mean, there are pictures on the internet of people who are ahead of my lineage. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Um, so it's not that far back, but but yeah, it, I have a uh, my friend went to Nigeria and they made a comment that they were surprised that we kept certain prayers going for our ceremonies that they stopped doing. Interesting. They actually had, they've, they've evolved away from it. Some of the prayers, and we we kept it going. And that's that's you know one of the effects of the slavery was that you know they were very conscious about preserving their heritage. And a lot of that came through prayers and song and, um, and the stories, of course. And, um, so we, we've, it's almost like uh, in some ways, some of the ceremonies are, are ceremonies, I think are maybe a little bit of a time capsule, um, which is, is which is a fascinating idea to me. Sure. Even, even the, the language is a little bit archaic, you know? Cool, man. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so going back a little bit. So it sounds like, if I'm hearing you correctly, you you don't find too much conflict as far as the worldview between your Western practices and your African practices. Because sometimes, yeah. you know, I'll, I'll I'll hear people or see people talking about, hey, you know, I I do practice and believe in Buddhism, and so I I uh, believe in reincarnation. But then I also practice this other other system which doesn't believe in reincarnation, and for me, that doesn't make sense because, you know, there's really only one reality. Uh, how can you switch off such a, a major belief when you're, you're in 
one mode and then turn it on when you're in another. Um, that's kind of where I am scratching my head sometimes when people are practicing multiple systems and there are those things that they're just switching on and off as if it's, you know, no big deal. Yeah, but you can't get more conflicting than being a serious Catholic and being a priest in the religion. Yeah. And it and it works still. And I've I've known <clears throat> I've known people who were uh I knew a guy years and years and years and years and years ago who was a fairly well known Yemaya possessi. Mm-hmm. Uh we don't call it that, but <laughs> But, um, and, um, he, uh, he was a serious Catholic. I mean, he would go to Spain every year. Those are those big processions they would do in Spain. He would go there every year. Um, so yeah, he was 110% Catholic, but he was, he was a Lucumi priest and there's, there's no conflict in his mind. And, you know, but really the, I think some of it is that Lucumi philosophy is pretty loose i mean there isn't like um a, you know really the <laughs> the biggest code of ethics is don't be a dick <laughs> nice, nice. <laughs> you know just i mean basically you know, be good to people but you don't like there isn't like a, a ten commandments or anything well there's also the distinction of lived spirituality or lived religion and uh, religion of the book and it's common across the board in many regions and among many cultures i mean you see it consistently where people who are cons- who are disciplined practitioners of any sort of faith end up being in some ways uh more open to the practices of other faiths because their experience of the religion is not sort of this as- assimilation of information and then the regurgitation of it in a rote in predictable fashion, according to dogmatic requirements. Instead, it's a lived experience of the spiritual practices which place one into contact with the actual lived reality of the interior world and its um, spiritual creatures. Yeah. I mean, really, your your and that's your Bible. That's what. Oh, sorry, go ahead. That's one world. It's one world. That's one right. world. Yeah, I mean, your your it's Bible in this world. religion is really your your itah. That reading you get. Um, that that's that's the pattern of destiny it's your destiny yeah i've seen i've seen practitioners of lakumi make equations between the netiru of of egyptian religion and and the orisha and i've also seen that in voodoo and i think that there is a legitimate a legitimate aspect to this in the same way that you saw this in really in, in europe with the sort of synthesis of different different you know, regional deities with other deities of neighboring cultures. I mean, this occurs all across the board on every continent and every place. Religious synthesis is again part of that mimetic transmission mm-hmm. of cultural osmosis. And these again, these aren't the province of the provin these aren't the province of the provincial, not to be redundant, but that I think it has more to do with the lived experience and the desire to make contact with transpersonal forces that are actual, that are real, that are distinct. And when you do that, it's not like there's, okay, there's that Catholic spiritual world and there's that Buddhist spiritual world right. and there's that Lukumi right. spirit. There's one spiritual world. There's one spiritual realm. And for the, once you get to a certain point as a practitioner, you start to perceive the bigger picture of that's beyond names in in more in ter- terms of the realities beyond the names. Well, that's the thing is the, you know, I mentioned the Ori earlier, the, your sort of connection to the divine. And that's, that's your, that's kind of your authority in a way, because really all this, all of this, all of these spiritual acts that you're doing in this religion are, are to keep you aligned to where you should be. And, you know, for me, I have this connection with astrology. And th- that's not going to be true of hardly anybody else. Yeah. You know, probably <laughs> in this religion, but I, that, but you know, Hey, you know, it happens. Um, but like I said, I don't, I, I've known, uh, I knew one Olorisha that grew up Muslim and he still derived a lot of peace from that. He never, he didn't really, you know, really leave it really. And it's probably a little bit more complicated on the Muslim side than it is the Lukumi side. 
There's yeah. no problem on our side at all. You can do whatever you want. But, um, but yeah, he, 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 he kept going. Um, I've known people who were, I think it'd be hard to be an atheist. Right. Um, right. but I mean, I, I, if you could be a Catholic, I don't see why you can't be anything else. I mean, you do see atheist like animists out there, which is always, I don't get it. I don't get it either. You also see a lot of atheist idiots out there. (laughs) (laughs) But no, that's, that, that is one thing I like about this is how it's, it is so individual and, you know, a good godparent doesn't really dictate what you do and don't do. It's, it's more steering you into, into figuring it out. And, you know, I've, I've, I've seen people get frustrated because they don't have, there isn't a lot of formal instruction Mm -hmm. and there isn't a lot of, I don't know, um, especially if you're starting out, you're, 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 you're kind of like, there's not a lot you can really do really. And so I've seen people get frustrated by that as well. So they, they kind of, you know, they get kind of, you know, I've seen many people <laughs> leave their religion because of that. Sure. I mean, it's a beneficial weeding out process as well. It is, but that's, but that's just kind of the way it is. I mean, there's, you know, when you don't, when you're just starting out and maybe you have your warriors, maybe you have, you know, Elagua and Ogun, Ochosi, um, there, there are no books. Well, there kind of are, but they're not good. <laughs> um, and <laughs> my godmother would never recommend them, <laughs> but um, but it's, it's a case by case basis. So, you know, a lot of it's maintenance, you know, you, you do these, you know, regular, simple things to sort of keep them, you know, energized or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, if something comes up, you ask for advice, what do you do? And then they'll give you some advice to do something and you do it. But, you know, there, until you, you know, you have to be in this, you have to be, you have to do this for, you know, for a very long time to really be able to get into, into that headspace. Uh, and if you're initiated, you kind of have the authority to do things on your own a little bit more, I guess, but you're not really on your own ever. But, you know, you can, you can sort of like take action a little bit more, but it takes years and years and years to get into that headspace to figure out what to do. I mean, there, there's no like automatic, I'm, you know, I'm a priest now, so <laughs> right. I'm going to be this amazing. I'm going to, I'm going to know everything, but it, it just doesn't work that way. So you don't know everything. Almost. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it's, it, it's, it's hard. I mean, I, I, um, that, that's one of the reasons why it took so long for me to talk about this too, because I, I've heard other things that are out there and it's very cringy. Yeah. And there's a lot of misinformation. I don't really even know if I've made sense today, but, <laughs> but like you did, I, started, I did, <laughs> but I started thinking to myself, I'm like, well, you know what? I have, you know, over 20 years initiated and 30 years of experience and it's got to count for something sure no i, th- yeah. I think that i think that qualifies you for sure but i i, I understand that the, the feeling for sure um i'm still i'm still messaging my godmother saying help <laughs> yeah no i mean that's good that's good so what are the what are the some of the most cringy misconceptions that you you know if if you can kind of set it straight do, do you have any that just uh, pop well, out to me well the cringiest really are those those damn Oshun altars that everybody puts up. Yeah. Cause there's nothing, this is not a solitary religion. Um, everything is given to you by somebody. So you just don't like make it up out of thin air. That doesn't happen. Uh, what else? I don't know. People trying to find out the Orisha on your, uh, on your head by tarot cards. I've seen that. Um, I've seen people getting a book, about the shell divination and using shells and they're not priests giving people free readings on uh, on that i've seen that before there's i mean people charging i don't know thousand dollars or so for necklaces um group ceremonies group necklacing ceremonies uh, under the guise of being traditional which it's not it's not it's not traditional in africa either not let alone leukemia it's just like you know, a lot of people, you know, make, you know, basically people try to put themselves on the map. Yeah. I mean, really, that's why I use the analogy of going on a date. Like, you know, if you get right, if you get red flags about someone, those red mm-hmm. flags are probably warranted, you know, because that's not going to change usually. Um, I mean, I, I've been lucky. I've, you know, both of my godparents have, I've pretty much found them immediately. 
and they ended up being the right people and they were who they said they were. <laughs> that's nice. Um, that's nice. <laughs> um, yeah. It sounds like you, you used the word predator earlier and it sounds like there are a lot of predators out there. Yeah. I'd say anything else though. I mean, it's, it's in non leukemia in the non leukemia world, but religion always attracts that. Um, yeah. I mean, for instance, um, one of the things that's universally frowned upon is a godparent should, should never have sex with a godchild ever. And that's universally frowned upon. So usually yes. if that gets out, that's a big deal. You know, yeah, we, we try to be very careful about respecting people's, you know, autonomy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, so again, if somebody, if someone is breaking that sort of personal space in any form whatsoever, um, that, that should be a huge red flag money. That's a big, that's a big thing, you know, it's, uh, cause we do charge money for ceremonies. Uh, I, I don't want to tell people how much things things should cost because that can be fluid. But you know, if someone's charging you fifty thousand dollars to be initiated, that's that's not good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> if they're charging you, you know, two thousand dollars to get necklaces, that's not good. Uh, we've heard of people charging money to be initiated to the table in a in a misa. Um, that's not good because why would you get charged money to talk to your own ancestors? Um, it's just, there's a lot of, yeah. So there's, there's, that stuff's out there. Um, you know, thankfully it's not the majority. Um, but you know, when you're just starting out and you don't know, and it's, it's, you know, for sheltered Americans, it's very easy to, you know, think that anybody who's talking a good talk, you know, must know what they're talking about. Yeah, it's hard. Um, so in America, for instance, how accessible is, is Lukumi Santeria, um, what what are good resources for people if they want to kind of vet someone? Is, is there is there a good way to do uh, that? Or? It's hard. Um, yeah. Well, the, the by far the biggest center is going to be Miami, um, New York, Bay Area, Chicago, places like that. Um, Texas has some. Um, Seattle has almost. <laughs> it's one of the worst places in the United States to find people. Um, <laughs> I, I I don't even know how I found my godmother here, but I did. That that doesn't happen. Um, you have to ask around. Yeah, and I mean, first you have to use your instincts. But you have to ask around because the people know people. So you know, when I met my godmother, you know, we didn't know each other, obviously, but you know, there was a, a priest that worked in her house uh, that she grew up with that used to work in my old house. You know, her husband was initiated. You know, he's a initiated to the drums, and so am I. And um, he, one of his teachers was someone who helped initiate me. So you get those kind of connections. So that 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 was how I kind of felt like that they Got it. were, you know, they that they were who they said they were. Um, I mean, it is a community. It should be a community. It's a there, community. Sh- there shouldn't be these kind of lone wolf people that are separate from community. Yeah, but places like Miami and New York, where there's there's a high concentration. Yeah, usually people know each other. Um, like, I don't know, I don't know anybody in New York, really, or too many people in the Bay Area. I probably know them more than they know me. Um, so it'd be hard for me to, like, so if someone were to ask me who's in New York, I'm like, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> um, but if you, if you kind of ask around, I mean, there's, the big cities have stores called uh, Botanicas um, that are usually pretty good resources. If you don't know anybody whatsoever, I mean, it's, that's, that's, you could do worse. It's better than online. Uh, I mean, some botanicas aren't great, but, you know, a lot of the established ones, you know, usually they know people. Okay, cool. Well, um, we know that you are a resource as far as the Western astrology. So where can people find you as in regard to that? But also, do you offer any services since you are an initiated priest? <laughs> uh, in the uh, Lukumi, um, I keep it fairly low key. Okay, um, I do work for um, our house uh, when it's needed, um, but I'm not really like I, right now. I'm not putting my feelers out there for people. Okay, I, I do. I, I do answer questions. I mean, if somebody has questions, but I'm not out there looking for God's children necessarily. Okay, um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, my website is ericrenew.com, and that's my astrology services. Okay. Awesome. And yeah, if, if they, 
you know, people listen to this, you don't necessarily have an online presence for your Lukumi practice. Is that I'm correct? I'm fairly quite online about it. Okay. Yeah. Um, I, I've been very measured about what I say, which is why it kind of gave me, I was a little bit, gave me the willies a little bit doing this online or even, you know, publicly here because I never really done it, done it publicly. Yeah. But um, because there's, uh, you know, there's a lot of, I mean, there, there are some groups like in Facebook, which they're not, I'll be honest with you, they're, 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 they're a crapshoot. There's a few, there's a few good people on them. There's a lot of really you know, just garbage. Um, there's, there's a, a, a decent website called about Santeria that has some basic stuff on it. And, um, and she, she basically designed it to be basic. Um, but it's good because there's no misinformation on there. Uh, book wise, you know, it's hard. Books are hard right now. So are you, are you open to people reaching out if they do have questions about, uh, the Santeria practice, the Lukumi practice? Yeah, if, if you have they... questions okay. and, you know, if, if I have to refer them to somebody else, I will. And I assume it's just case by case, depending on what the case situation case. and okay. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. And they can find you on ericperdue.com. Mm-hmm. Cool. Anything, yeah. uh, anything you want to end with any oh my gosh. comments or comments, concerns, <laughs> <laughs> how did we do today um i think we think right off the top of my head okay hopefully hopefully no what pressure. i said made sense <laughs> yeah no it was great no it's great no, um like i said we we covered a bunch of different african traditions already and so it's it's great to get lakumi centuria that perspective in um and you've been doing this for so long and we've already have a little bit of a relationship with you. So I think this mm-hmm. was perfect to kind of have you come back on. And again, I just love the fact that you are open-minded and are kind of have your foot in, in multiple things. And so you're, you've got kind of an expanded perspective on things, which is great. Expanded, but limited. <laughs> Cause our listenership is, is varied. Um, <laughs> so it's good to have someone on who can kind of speak to all these different kind of angles. So thank you for coming on again, Eric. We really appreciate oh, it. You. Janice had to jump off. It's pretty I, I late. Yeah. It's pretty late where he's at now, but um, uh, on behalf of him, myself and our listeners, again, thanks for giving us your time and educating us on this and being open to kind of further conversation. Yeah. And I'd be happy to return someday. Cool, man. Yeah. We'd love to have you back. <laughs> Okay, that was Eric Perdue. Interesting person, man of many hats, and we are grateful for his time and effort and energy. It was so interesting talking to him. He's so fun to have on the show, and I'm grateful that we had the opportunity to kind of have this exchange again. Yeah, no, he's a great guy. Um, Our Agrippa episode with him was fantastic. His translation is very well received and, uh, you know, we're we're happy about his success and hope for his continued success. Um, make sure to, you know, check out what he has to offer. And, you know, I think this was very interesting seeing this, this other side of, of his practice. And it shows that you, you can have this kind of, uh, I wouldn't say syncretism with him, but he's not, and you don't have to be, um, so rigid in your, your, uh, beliefs that you can't kind of be open to other other ideas and other practices. Um, so I think that's very valuable. Um, I specifically liked, um, and it echoed what we had talked about with uh, Rocky and Voodoo, of, you know, a little while back. Um, I liked the emphasis of the spirits um, as forces of nature, at least in some regards or in some aspects, because like you had even mentioned uh, Janus in our episode with Jack Grail and Susie Chang, I think you were talking about Zeus and lightning. The lightning, yes, is an epiphany of Zeus, but it's also Zeus. So I, I think this is an interesting mystery to really meditate on as far as the nature of the gods and spirits go. Absolutely. No, I mean, it's difficult for the Western mind trained in, um, discursive reasoning and um, materialistic analysis to comprehend the simplicity of imminence. However, it's important 
to learn how to shift into an archaic mindset where the very stones beneath our feet are filled with life and meaning and are connected to an entire web-like network of interdependent phenomena originating from different points of causation in the cosmos. Different cultures conceptualize this and clothe it in the forms of their ethnic images and ideas and colors and patterns and stories and myths. But if we get into the metaphysical dimension, as uh, the special man brought us towards, you can get beyond some of that and start to understand the sort of dynamic reality underneath the surface of all of it. And I like how Eric was able to kind of bring us there too. The book review this week is for, to me, one of the best examples ever to come onto the scene in terms of Egyptian spirituality and magic. It's called The Sacred Magic of Ancient Egypt by Rosemary Clark. It's recently been, I believe, re-released and can be found on Amazon. The original release was from Llewellyn Books. This is a veritable tome, hundreds of pages, uh, which goes directly into reconstructed Egyptian liturgy. It explains the structure of the priesthood, the divine images, the worlds of being. It's the companion volume um, to another book that she wrote. This book is useful because it gives you so much practical material to work with. It's a great companion to Rittner's Mechanics of Ancient Egyptian Ritual Practice. And again, it's called The Sacred Magic of Ancient Egypt by Rosemary Clark. I definitely recommend it if you're interested in ancient Egyptian magic. As I've said, I believe that she has recently re-released it uh, under a self-publishing house on Amazon. It is worth the investment. You're getting a a pretty substantial book here. And if you take the time to read it and study it, you will learn so much, um, especially if you read it in tandem or sequentially with books like uh, Temple of the Cosmos by Jeremy Nadler, Conceptions of God in Ancient Egypt by Hornung, even um, even books on late Neoplatonic theurgy would help you to understand the Egyptian tradition, which is not surprising given that folks like Iamblichus indicated that that was the origin of the tradition. Great. Awesome. So let's wrap up for today. Thank you everyone for listening. We really sincerely appreciate your, your listenership and your support. And we will see you in the next episode. <laughs>